Hello and welcome to Naval Horizons. I'm Samina Mondal, a public affairs intern with the US Naval Research Laboratory, part of the Naval Research Enterprise. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Jeff Ellen, a research scientist specializing in computer science at the Naval Information Warfare Pacific. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Ellen. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. So you've had such a interesting experience when it comes to computer science, starting off with your undergrad all the way to PhD. So could you describe a little bit about how you got your start in the Department of the Navy specifically? Um, I got my start in the Navy directly out of college. So um, after high school, I went to the University of Illinois to do a bachelor's and a master's in computer science. And um, the, there were a lot of companies and government agencies like that came to campus recruiting um, for computer scientists. And um, the Navy was the one that I found the most interesting. Wonderful. And could you give us a little bit of a background on choosing your major, perhaps the journey that you had in academics? For me, it wasn't quite straightforward. In high school, I was definitely... Um, very good at math and science, but I wasn't quite sure what I could do with those like skills just as a mathematician or like a chemist. Um, so I went into a general engineering program for the first couple of years. Uh, I was in my degree, wasn't sure if that was quite right for me either, and eventually decided I wanted to work on robotics. Um, and so I transferred into the computer science program as a junior. Um, took a bunch of computer science classes, stayed to get my master's degree focusing on machine learning and other things applicable to robotics. And, um, you know, it took uh, some turns there because like I wasn't, wasn't sure what I wanted to do, um, even though, you know, my grades were good. And um, NYWIC recruited me and said that I would have my choice of what I would want to work on. And so I came out to NYWIC and tending to work on robotics and found that um, the problems that they had related to human natural language processing were something else that I could use my computer science and machine learning background on. And um, the robotics problems they had, they had other people working on them and maybe weren't quite, you know, so I ended up working on that for about 10 years. Um, and when I went back, um, NYWIC offered me the opportunity to get my PhD and um, so I went back to school here at the University of California, San Diego to get my PhD program and intended to either work on robotics or natural language processing, but found um, a group at Scripps Institution of Oceanography that had a very interesting data set and was starting to do some machine learning, but you know, needed some help. And so ended up taking a lot of oceanography classes. And so now for the past 10 years, I've kind of been doing oceanography and machine learning. So, I mean, it's... Not necessarily straightforward, I guess, for everybody. Right. And it's so interesting to see how you've combined almost your background in computer science to naval applications. And so many students want to take part in computer science, whether that be at the high school or college level. So could you describe a little bit more about how you use CS in your job for the Navy? So I use um, computer science pretty much every day. Um, sometimes I'm just writing short programs to kind of tabulate some statistics for me. Um, other times I've, uh, when I was before my PhD, I worked on a, um, a chat program, um, kind of like doing instant messages for the Navy. And so um, I was working as a software engineer for that, helping write the user interface. Um, as a machine learning researcher, I was also looking at the data and how we could maybe surface the right data for people faster. Um, but, you know, that was, like three years working on the same piece of software day in and day out every day. Um, and I wrote a very small part of that software, but that software is now on um, hundreds, if not thousands of ships in the Navy um, with thousands of people using it every day. So it's pretty fun to think that I contributed to that. It's incredible. And so through your computer science expertise, you're able to dive into these specifics and niches of machine learning and research, plankton imaging and processing oceanographic data. But could you tell us how you use STEM in your day-to-day -day job as you head into the work? 
whether that be your computer work or things that you do that are applicable to the Navy? Sure. Um, so I think to kind of put that into context, like what I've been working on the last, I'll, I'll explain what I've been working on like the last few years and I can show how, how STEM fits in with that. So um, the ocean is a big place and currently the, there's two ways that um, scientists and the Navy gather information about the ocean. They either use very expensive, highly precise instruments like a very, um, like a $10,000 temperature probe or $1 million hydrophone that listens to acoustic signals underwater, or um, we use satellites, which can detect and measure things over the ocean, but they can only average over very large um, spatial areas and they aren't necessarily visiting, like they don't necessarily cover the whole ocean at the whole, you know, at once. And so, um, DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency um, that also invented the internet and GPS and other things like that, um, decided that there would be maybe a need for a very inexpensive floating instrument to kind of fill in the gap between these two extremes, like an expensive, highly precise one of a sensor or you know a satellite which can do broad. So the idea was to make like a floating cell phone or floating Raspberry Pi for around $500 and make thousands of them and deploy them. And so that's what I've, that's what I've been working on the past five years. And so um, STEM, every part of STEM plays into that. So the science part of STEM is um, in order to build these instruments, we need to understand like the physical and chemical processes that are going on in the ocean. So that draws on, on biology, physics, physics and chemistry. Um, the technology part is understanding what currently is available for purchase, like what can you buy thousands of for inexpensive. And so, like I said, Raspberry Pi and understanding um, like what thermistors or microphones are available for inexpensive, what, you know, what types of GPS chips are available. Um, which solar panels will give the right amount of, of energy. Um, the engineering comes into play, like maybe making a new sensor and or combining these existing sensors into a single package about the size of a volleyball, like that um, can live out in the ocean. And then math, once we've deployed these, all of these instruments, there's a lot of mathematics involved, summarizing the statistics and trying to understand what's going on. So. I mean, really, the, in the letters of STEM, I'm using them all pretty much uh, every day. Wonderful. And it's great to see that such simple things like microcontrollers, like Raspberry Pis, so many students are familiar with, you're also incorporating into your high expertise and job within the Navy. So could you give us a little bit of a overview of the naval relevance behind what you do each day? Sure. Um, so the Navy, um, is operating in the ocean every day. And so they need to understand the ocean. So for example, um, they need to know what the weather is gonna be out there, whether or not like they're sending their ships into rough seas or um, whether or not they're using the most accurate path to get somewhere that will use the least fuel or get them there the fastest. And um, there's a lot of civilian like focus on meteorology and weather over land, but really, other than the Navy, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of um, for-profit enterprises available in for in weather forecasting over the ocean. So the Navy kind of has to be its own meteorology department for the ocean. So um, that's one way um, that understanding the ocean is relevant to the Navy. Um, another thing that the Navy does is do, does a lot of sensing um, in the water, like looking. Um, for objects under the water. And so for doing that, they're using um, sonar and microphones or lasers and LIDAR to try to detect what's in what's under there. And again, um, there's not necessarily the same amount of industry, like looking at how signals propagate through the air is a lot different than how they propagate through an ocean that has varying properties and, and lots of biology living in it. So, um, it's important for the Navy to understand 
what things are in the ocean and how signals work in the ocean. Um, and another example, um, so specifically like with these uh, inexpensive floats that I mentioned, one of the neatest things about them is you deploy them and they drift. And so even just thinking of them as floating GPS gives some very interesting information. Um, the Navy already has models for predicting where these floats would end up, but our floats are showing, you know, that the models might not always be correct or there's ways that they could be improved. And why does the Navy care about the motion of the, of, um, the ocean surface? Well, if they're looking for a man overboard or trying to find something like they want to know where, where the water's moving. So um, that's a few of the ways in that uh, um, studying the ocean is relevant for the Navy. And it's clear, Dr. Allen, that you utilize those various applications of computer science, and you've been through the aspects of research and design as well within the process along the way. But could you share with us perhaps a favorite memory that you've had on the job, whether that be a project or something incredible you were able to experience? Yeah, so, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, I, ha I have uh, incredible moments like every few months when, when if I'm on a ship or something that growing up like in Illinois I never would have imagined like being out in the ocean. Um, but one particular memory that sticks out for me um, is when I was doing the software engineering uh, on the chat uh, client that I mentioned earlier. Um, through just a big scheduling quirk, I had returned to school to get my PhD and the rest of the team that was responsible wasn't available. And there was a aircraft carrier in Pearl Harbor that wanted to get underway very shortly, but they were having problems with the software. And since I knew I was one of the developers and knew how to do it, I was asked with very short notice to get on a flight, go out to Hawaii. I was in Hawaii for a total of about eight hours. So arrived like in the afternoon, did my work and then left. And so then the next day I was trying to explain to my professors like why I didn't do my homework um, because I had to go fly out um, and fix software on an aircraft carrier. And I'm not sure if that professor believed me, but that's... <laughs> So, excuse. <laughs> yeah, that, that sticks out as a little bit of a unique experience, I think. That's wonderful. So even thinking about how your work and technology contributes to naval challenges, what are some of those that stick out to you? So, um, you know, I think there's a there's a challenge that um, we're trying to address in this in the Starpa program that I mentioned that these um, that these teams are working on for DARPA, but it's it's coming into play across all of the Navy. And that I think can be summarized as like edge computing. And so at this moment in time, it seems like things like Raspberry Pis, microcontrollers, webcams, like all that kind of stuff is smaller, cheaper, more power efficient, and it can be combined into smaller devices, devices that are deployed all over the place. However, the network bandwidth doesn't necessarily, you know, isn't necessarily keeping up um, with those advances. So, for example, in the floats that I am talking about, we have optical cameras on them, but the cameras take an, um, individual frames of like three megabytes. But every hour, the float can only afford, through its power um, and data restrictions, to send back around 300 to 400 bytes. So when you're building a device that is capable of so much, but can only send back like one one millionth or less of what it's recording, like that's a challenge. And so that's where some things like math and machine learning and engineering and all these things come into play to try to do what's this edge computing, processing data on the edge instead of shipping it all back to a data center where a human could review it or something like that. So I think that's, that's something that I'm thinking about a lot and a lot of other people um, across the DoD. And I mean, honestly, industry and everywhere is thinking about right now. And looking forward, how do you see those elements of science and technology in your career field transforming the future through computer science? Um, I mean, I think it's kind of obvious that like whether, whether it's commercial companies or the Department of Defense, like. People want to know what's going on faster, 
then can just be observed. So like rather than one person going and visiting somewhere and reporting what they've seen, like we want to summarize everything. And so whether that's doing things like sending out cars with you know, street view um, by Google so that we could see where we're going on a Google map or you know, looking at satellites overhead and trying to decide like um, how you know, crops are doing on a global basis or how the rainforests are doing. I mean, I think people want to process data and understand what's going on in a wide variety of problems. And so I cannot, one thing I think I can be sure of is that the demand for computer science and, and data analytics is, is just gonna keep going up. Of course, the innovation is continuing and also growing into so many different forms of expansion. And as a naval STEM leading innovator in your field within the wonders of computer science, what do you say makes you most enthusiastic about going to work each day? Personally, uh, I find very interesting is that the Navy works on things that industry doesn't, and usually because they aren't profitable. Um, so for example, um, as part of the, um, um, the PhD, uh, program that I was in, um, which is, uh, has the acronym of SMART, which is sponsored by ASEE. Um, they also gave me some extra funding to help me kind of get reestablished and like take the, in order to take the fullest advantage of the PhD that I had gotten, um, they supported me by allowing me to purchase a plankton camera um, so that I could take my own um, plankton images and continue doing the machine learning on plankton that I had started um, in my in my PhD, and so um, a plankton camera is not a very common uh, object, and it's not something that I would probably be able to convince somebody in industry um, to buy. But um, so it's a combination of you know very hard and challenging problems plus the knowledge that not many other people are working on it. So I really need to come through. It's fantastic to see that transition from being a student and also being in the workforce kind of come together through the Department of the Navy. And it's really evident within your story. Well, Dr. Ellen, I think this was a great conversation and it was very interesting to learn more about the ways that you use computer science in your day-to-day -day job. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us today? I'm one of 3,000 scientists and engineers at my facility and there's couple dozen of these facilities around the country. And so, I mean, I think a lot of us have had very different, but, you know, very interesting experiences. So um, thanks for talking to me. Of course. And thank you so much for letting us listen to more about your story and your insights. And I know there's so many students out there, whether that be in high school and college, it'll benefit. The future of computer science is so broad. So it's great to see the applications in the Navy. Thanks. And thank you all at home for watching. Be sure to check out past and future episodes. And until next time, I'm Samina Mondal, and this is Naval Horizons.